little bit longer. Um, but just to kind of help us uh, with our thinking, because um, we're sort of behind in the region. We're behind where Marta and her group are in terms of thinking about um, biological impacts of, of nutrients and dissolved oxygen. And so it's useful, we think, to hear um, not only sort of the direction and directions they've gone, but also what are the key things that we should be thinking about, some of those key things. So, so the technical uncertainties, I'll just read this through real quick, that are identified in the implementation strategy are, and sorry my squinting, it's so small on my screen, but um, old eyes. What are the dissolved oxygen requirements for the most sensitive species, including an adequate margin of safety? How should the duration and spatial extent of lower DO events be considered relative to the needs of the most sensitive species? And what is the best method to estimate, as Gordon was highlighting, the uncertainty um, in these DO benchmarks? Um, we have some, also some research actions identified in the implementation strategy that we can consider. Um, and they include identifying the species that might be at highest risk. So how do we prioritize which species to think about? Um, performing a literature review, focusing on sensitivity, and then um, use some potentially use some model output to help um, produce spatially explicit exposure maps. Um, and then those are these are dis discussion questions that we'll return to. But like I said, we're first going to ask Marta to just help frame up this conversation based on their experience and what she thinks we should be thinking about. So Marta, I'll hand it off to you. Great. If you if you guys are okay with it, um, I'll share my screen again because I skipped over a couple of slides that could be helpful for this discussion. So the version that you guys have is um, doesn't have those slides. So I'm going to share. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, thank you so much. So um, well, good morning, everyone. So hopefully you're not tired of of hearing me talk. Um, what what I think is you know I think. Um, Honestly, one of the most challenging parts of this discussion of, you know, guiding and using models to inform nutrient management is um, assembling a credible framework for interpreting biological effects. So this, if this feels like hard, a hard thing to do, everyone is struggling with it. We're not necessarily that much farther ahead than you. I think we've been talking about it a lot, but, um, and I think that one of the things that as a scientist working in this space, what I can tell you is that the degree to which we can collaborate on this science together and develop sort of a common conceptual approach is really beneficial because this is not easy for managers to understand the science. And I think that that's, it, it's actually really helpful. So I'm, I'm optimistic about working with you guys in that way. And I'm excited about this conversation with you. And sort of to take this back to the problem statement, um, what I had said in my talk was that existing ocean and estuarine water quality criteria for oxygen and pH are not biologically relevant for the most part, even when they're expressed as deviation from natural. And I think I can appreciate why that's a great idea to, ex to express it in that way. We almost always have an insufficient temporal baseline of data to clearly define that deviation. And, and if you say, okay, well, it's not gonna work on the uh, temporal, um, sort of perspective, how about spatial? Can we define spatially what reference looks like? The attempt to compare with minimally disturbed reference, either estuaries, you know, it's really confounded by a shifting baseline of anthropogenic effects, either local or global. Um, and, and, and I would point to particularly um, that, you know, there is a great paper that if you guys want to think about this topic a little bit more, this paper by Thomas Eddy and, and Gobbler, which in which they're sort of challenging, um, you know, our current approach to regulating um, oxygen and pH, um, due to the fact that you know we have kind of a brave new world of climate change um, and this natural baseline of, of, of variability is really shifting um, in part because of water temperatures or warming that really make it much, much more challenging now to use some of these old paradigms. And so I think that that's the problem statement. And so I've been working for the last 15 years to try to use an approach called the Virginia Province approach, which is the commonly accepted method by regulators to develop site-specific dissolved oxygen criteria. And in a nutshell, this is sort of the approach, which is to identify fish and invertebrate um, species who live there, 
review the existing data on the tolerance of those species to low dissolved oxygen, looking at both acute and chronic endpoints, identifying the most sensitive endpoints with respect to individual species. And often, and I'll come, I have a slide on this to focus on this uh, topic, in the absence of data, cons consider a nearest relative um, in order to be able to come up with a number. And then if appropriate, finally calculate the uh, numeric criteria that, that would be produced out of this process. So in a very high level, this is the Virginia province approach. And this is um, um, the EPA accepted methodology to refine um, dissolved oxygen uh, criteria. So what I've sort of encountered is that there are a lot of scientific challenges of this. First of all, there's very little data to define sublethal endpoints for Pacific West Coast species. The whole VPA approach came out of the Atlantic um, estuary, in particular Chesapeake Bay. And so most of the data that are sourced from the EPA um, experiments that were conducted decades ago to support dissolved oxygen criteria um, in Chesapeake Bay are really tuned up for those species and not for our West Coast, um, our West Coast species. Um, this approach also does not consider multiple st um, stressors and the experiments that were conducted to support this original work really, um, uh, they not only ignore sort of the temperature effects on physiological tolerance, but also they kept pH artificially high while in nature, oxygen and, and um, pH co-vary. And so there's this additional unaccounted for stress in that sort of um, in that in that data um, set that this paper by Tomasetti and Gobler really sort of point to as problematic. And so the recommendations um, that I would have for you guys as we sort of wade through this issue together is number one, identify your key data gaps through a literature review first. And you can see in Tessa's sort of slide deck that that concept is there. Um, invest in cu coupled chemical and biological monitoring, characterize your DO regime, understand it, and then compare the chemistry and the physics of your system with species abundance and what that tells you about what's going on there. Sometimes it's not just a dissolved oxygen problem, it's a temperature problem. Um, and that's often what fisheries biologists will say what rules the day in controlling species distribution. Collect experimental data sets of physiological tolerance for your most sensitive species focusing on sublethal endpoints. So I'm not talking hypoxia, I'm talking about growth and reproduction. Um, and finally, consider then as you engage with policymakers, they're going to be wedded with their paradigms. But as scientists, then what we've done is say, well, let's compare those, um, the output from things like the Virginia province approach with other approaches um, that may be a bit more modern um, in, in their um, construction. And the metabolic index um, is an example in order to have a side-by-side -side comparison and a constructive conversation about um, what, what levels of oxygen um, and how it's mediated by temperature, for example, may actually be the, um, the most protective. And so I'll stop there. I have a few more slides that unpackages a little bit more about the metabolic index, but I don't want to steal the air um, in this breakout room. And let's see what, what you guys are interested in talking about. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Marta. Um, I see. So, so I think what we'll do here is we'll take some questions first from Marta, just based on what she um, briefly shared there. Um, and then we can see how the discussion goes from there. So I see, and please use the raise hand function um, and I'll, I'll, I'll do that. So I see Paul McCollum has his hand raised. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to point out a connection between the chronic and acute uh, impacts on juvenile cell monitors, for example, mm -hmm. the respiration budget is our highest energy budget uh, overall. And and a lot of oceanographers think, you know, three parts per million is hypoxia, but anything, we've done studies that anything below 50% saturation, there, there becomes respiration stress in salmonids. And we did tests in tanks <clears throat> because we researched, uh, we tried to find, you know, academic stuff, but we, we, we had to do it ourselves. But, but basically when, when you do some tests, 
the ones that are in respiration stress, where, where scientists would say that's a chronic impact, but they're so stressed they have no reaction to predation. Mm -hmm. they're, they're in respiration stress, and that goes chronic to acute, basically with with vulnerability to. It's more complex, I guess. What I'm saying, the right. the, the the issue between acute and chronic is is uh, there's a high vulnerability to to juvenile cell monads in particular when when they're in uh, uh, you know uh, respiration stress. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's a that's a really great point, and I think well to go even farther, we don't really understand how respiration stress is interacting with stress from toxic contaminants, from microplastics, from um, the essentially the um, concentrations of some of the uh, contaminants of emerging concern. And so ultimately there's a lot of uncertainty um, for which I think it's really important, again, to kind of go back to, to data, um, observational data and ask yourself where, at what levels of oxygen and, and how it co-varies with temperature are you actually really sustaining um, reproducing populations, like healthy, thriving populations of organisms. Um, and that makes us feel like we've constrained uncertainty better. Yeah, great. Thanks, Paul and Marta. I see Alan next and then Gordon. Go ahead. Hi, Alan. <laughs> Hi. Okay, Hi. Okay, you can hear me, right? Uh-huh. So I keep thinking about my days at Squirp back in the 1970s and things that we were thinking about in terms of the, the ultimate fate of nitrogen. We did one study with the uh, uh, nitrogen isotopes and found that the Dover Sol that were once there in a very huge abundance were now gone, but about a third of their body was made up of nitrogen from the uh, wastewater outfalls at White's mm -hmm. Point. Um, but that's a tiny little piece of a larger question that I have, which is, is there something we can learn from less, uh, get lessons from, from uh, natural um, oxygen stressed ecosystems? Um, and I keep thinking about the per Peruvian anchovy fishery, mm -hmm. the sea birds that feed off of that, the, the recycling of the guano. Um, there's a whole system there that has a lot of variability. It's very productive and it, you know, it, it's probably based mostly on natural nitrogen, but um, I guess I'd like to see a, a reinvestigation of these natural systems where there's high productivity of uh, secondary and tertiary production. Uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, how do those, how do those uh, uh, communities adapt? Why are they so productive? And, and are they that productive in a low deal uh, environment? Um, anyway, I just wanted to throw that out as a, you know, a, another set of models that uh, we all might want to look at. I'm sure we don't want all the salmon to disappear from Puget Sound in the places full of anchovies, but, um, but there may be some lessons from these other natural uh, ecosystems that were studied intensely years ago. I don't know what the current situation is. I'll shut up. <laughs> well, and I think that that's a really good um, segue, I think, to you know, how do you manage um, ecosystems and species under an era of a lot of uncertainty? And I guess my only thought is that none of these decisions get made quickly. And oftentimes, even if we say, okay, we're all gonna to work together on you know, nutrient load reduction, on ecosystem restoration, it takes time and you have a big sort of baseline at which you can be monitoring how the, how the ecosystem is responding. And so I think that there's opportunity um, if you're all sort of committed and working together and collecting data to really be able to start to fine tune um, um, essentially the management knobs that can help to really support these resilient ecosystems. But it's essential then if you're gonna take that approach that you really need to have the data to document and make it a sort of science-driven decision-making. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about, Marta, was your, one of your bullets there and the sort of advice, <laughs> like under, you know, part of it is understanding your natural oxygen regime. Right, mm -hmm. like 
first of all, understand what you're dealing with. It, it also, I think it relates to Alan Chapman's comment here in the chat um, about the challenge being demonstrating the difference between oceanic and the anthropogenic contributions. Mm -hmm. The impact of DO is relevant, but the difference is things that can be changed versus things that can be adapted to. Um, right. so, okay, thanks for that, Alan. Um, I'll go to Gordon next. Hi, um, thanks. I'm kind of build a little bit on what Alan was talking about. He kind of stole my my thunder <laughs> there a little um, and just say, you know, it seems like the approaches um, have been largely species based and even within species individual based. So what we know is like the effect of an individual being oxygen stressed. And then you have this challenge of extrapolating the population there. But has there been a move to think more ecosystem based and to recognize, hey, maybe dissolved oxygen is important for denitrification and low dissolved oxygen is areas are important for denitrification and primary productivity is the base of the food web and that there's interactions there and that needs to be considered and or maybe it's just the case that legally you just can't go there it's just we're at a the legal scenario is such that it's really species based and we need to stay at species based well, you know, I would say that there's really a lot of variability in, you know, how that conversation has been had across the globe from ecosystem based to species based. And I think what I do see, though, is that the way in which people go at that conversation with water quality managers and what sort of constraints are presented by the regulatory framework does limit what people can do. And here's an example. Um, in one watershed that I've been working, you know, that I worked for in, for 10 years, um, the, the water quality managers, the regulators decided that they were not going to do a TMDL, that they were going to do essentially um, sort of a cooperative action um, oriented towards restoration and that they would be putting all of the commitments in the permits of people without actually having sort of a promulgated TMDL. And the, the result of that was that, you know, the landowner immediately took the agriculture out of commission um, and the SRA responded beautifully. Um, and the other sort of cooperating entities upstream have been already working on reductions of nutrient loads without necessarily even understanding ultimately what, what's required. And so that's a really nice example where just the regulatory framework permitted that cooperative action, um, whereas sometimes it's just depending on the particular um, place that you're working in, it can actually really constrain you and force you down a road that no one thinks makes any sense, but yet you do it anyway. So, um, you know, ultimately, I think um, the way in which you can do that just really depends on who you're able to bring to the table um, and the faith that you have one another and um, and kind of carrying through those actions. I can't speak to that in the Puget Sound, so. Yeah, that's great. I mean, thanks for that, Gordon. And I'm just going to, I mean, I, I think we want to get in this conversation today to pick up on that a little bit, which is that if we are taking, regardless of whether we're taking a more ecosystem approach, we, we want to have that species data. We want to have the information on a species level. And, the, and I think one of the questions that we're after here is sort of how do we how do we decide which species are the priorities or do we prioritize like how do we decide you know it's quite a bit of work so do we uh, you know how do we start looking at this and um there's a question in the chat um here like actually oh it's from mark actually mark i'm gonna let you you're, you got your hand raised so i don't know if you're gonna maybe you can also bring up the point you made in the chat which is relevant to kind of how you choose species right right um martha do you have any uh species in the bite on the federal endangered species act list as threatened or endangered um in terms of fisheries um i would say you know probably not to my knowledge you know i think i should be careful because i'm not a fisheries biologist so we may not actually know but that's not what's driving our conversation in the bite. And ultimately, you know, when, when we take it back to salmonids, 
um, that does drive the conversation um, for us in a lot of our estuaries and watersheds along the California coast. Mm -hmm. um, and so it ends up being sort of the big daddy and it sort of trumps all. Um, and, and that ends up being almost our, our sole focus oftentimes um, which in some ways, you know, it's, it, it simplifies the conversation, but it, it also ends up, you know, causing sort of a, um, a sort of very narrow viewpoint um, in which you could be discarding solutions that may be really good for the ecosystem, but that don't speak specifically to, to Salmonids, right? So. Yeah, I, we I have in, I in Puget Sound, I'm not off the top of my head, can't remember how many there are, but mm -hmm. there are certainly more than one and not all Salmonids either. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have Orca, <laughs> right. we have, we have uh, Killer Whale for that matter. So while an ecosystem approach would be great, I think at, at the end of the day, there's going to be have to be some focus on some key individual species. Right. Well, you know, and I would say if you established, if you establish a science-based process in which you, you know, it, it may be that what is sort of apparently driving a decision could be a species, but that um, you really make the effort to try to um, support and present in a timely fashion any other information about how potential actions can be influ influencing the ecosystem and its components in real time. I think that you know the potential that you have is to is to at least have the water quality agencies understanding and appreciating how the complexity of um, the response of the ecosystem and how their actions, could be influencing um, something outside of maybe that narrow species specific focus. So I think that, you know, what I like about, you know, San Francisco Bay and, and even the Puget Sound is that you guys have a rich scientific community that you can really lean on in that way. And it's just a matter of figuring out how do you pull together the forums for those discussions so that their science can be synthesized and, um, in, in a kind of clear and compelling way for managers. Actually, I think I should remember this. Uh, the ESA does not only protect the species, but also the ecosystem on which they depend. So, I mean, there is broad language in the ESA, but it, it is very individually species centric. And yeah, thanks for that, Mark. I mean, I think there, there's precedent for evaluating this in the context of essential fish habitat. And when Marta and I have talked about that a little bit. Um, so, so I'm interested. So, Ellen, first of all, Ellen Mearns, your hand is still up. I don't know if that's legacy or uh, you have a new thing. Okay. Oh, you do want to, you have a new thing? Okay, go for it. Go for it. I, I guess I'm confused because when we started out this morning, um, my notes show that uh, this is not a discussion of uh, standards, and yet this is what we've been talking about basically for the past uh, 15 or 20 minutes. So I'm, I guess I'm confused. Okay, so, well, sor sorry for the confusion. Um, maybe it would help if we um, maybe Chris, if you could throw up the slide again that sets up the breakout. I think we're I think we're not necessarily talking about standards. Rather, we're trying to talk about how we might frame a set of evaluations, potentially monitoring, um, to shift the conversation to focus on biological impacts. So what species and habitats do we think about? Um, how do we consider sensitivity? Not, I mean. I think hand in hand with sort of how might the decision making flow from that, but I think we're also just thinking about the science of how you might consider sensitivity. Um, we talked about lethal versus um, sublethal effects, and then also sort of you know what existing information do we have? So, for example, Paul threw out there some information about some laboratory experiments that they've done. You know, it'd be good for us to know about what existing information do we have, 
The other thing I'll just frame up um, that I'm hoping to get your input on um, today in the last 15 minutes before I move to calling on Jeff um, is that we have an opportunity to do things in the near term and then in the longer term. Um, obviously, setting up a monitoring program is a, sort of a longer term aim. <laughs> and, and as Marta said, you know, she's been working on establishing this Virginia province approach for many, many years. But in the short term, we have an opportunity to use existing information that's a bit more narrowly focused. And is it worthwhile starting with a literature search where we just focus on lethal impacts? How do we choose the species for that? Um, you know, what sort of data do we have available? I think we can also look at just what's our initial step at shifting this conversation so that we are thinking more about the critters and thinking less about the standards. Um, I'm interested in, in hearing people um, talk about what they think the important considerations are there, both in the short term and the long term. Um, and now I'll call on Jeff. Go for it. Good morning. Um... Yeah, I had a question, Marta. Um, I think I saw on one of your slides that you guys also are dealing with a natural background condition, and that's a big thing that we're, has arisen in the Puget Sound, knowing that there's a, a large natural source coming in from the, the ocean that's affecting the sound. So it's kind of a two-part question. How are you thinking and evaluating effects on species, you know, if they were being affected pre-anthropogenic times. And then kind of a twofer question is, how are you working with your regulators um, on a work plan? Are you working in a work plan fashion, bringing the regulators along? Seems like this conversation is ripe for that. How does this group bring the regulators along? Because we're kind of dealing with a fairly litigious situation up here where they're in kind of a, I will understand as somewhat of a stand down situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, try to, to sort of try to quickly answer those two questions. Um, ultimately, you know, when we try to um, sort of identify what is anthropogenically driven versus what may be from natural background, you know, we, we've leaned the most on our models to try to do that with varying degree to degrees of credibility. Um, and so uh, there's a modeling approach, um, which you know it works could probably work fairly well for um, for pH re uh, related impacts. There's also um, the opportunity to characterize what is sort of a minimally disturbed reference system through observations, which I think is much more challenging for estuaries. But ultimately, what we try to do is then to construct model scenarios in which we've removed anthropogenic influences and then look at the difference. Um, and so then, especially if you have an ocean driven sort of signature, then you can try to remove that through a difference of two scenarios um, in which the ocean's influence is present. And then look at how that changes the frequency in which, you know, if there's a problem being caused, you know, how, how is the frequency changed by it? So that's how we're approaching it. I think it's a real question how to do that credibly. And that's a longer science um, um, conversation. When you talk about the second question of how do you bring the regulators along? How do you assemble a work plan? I think that that's a sticky wicket because the regulators, um, you know, the water quality um, uh, agencies need to be firmly in charge of their process and they, often feel nervous if the scientists start to lead them um, in that. Um, and so one way in which we've done that with them is to have them set up stakeholder work groups in which it's like a listening session. Um, and then the scientists and the you know, concerned stakeholders get to talk about the science and also use that opportunity to engage on some of the policy discussions. Ultimately, um, it, you know, I think it, it's situation dependent in this particular circumstance with you guys in which there's a lawsuit that may be more difficult, but that doesn't mean that you can't still proceed with a conversation in which you assemble a technical work group focused on the science, you know that this is going to be policy relevant, and yet you focus and, and try to get consensus on the science. 
um, that could help the regulators in their own um, kind of um, in in their um, in their work to figure out what they're going to do about this could be considered um, by that group, even if they're not at the table. And and I'll say I'm going to kind of point to a couple of things that I think are really important beyond just sort of the focus on what's the thresholds. Is that number one? I don't hear a lot of consensus yet around the problem statement in Puget Sound. What is the problem? Is low DO really a, a, really a problem? Um, and what evidence do you have for that? Do you also have other evidence that other sort of eutrophication impacts are occurring, harmful algal blooms, um, acidification, um, so the list could be long, um, you know, impacts to your benthic habitat. So I think using um, your scientific community to synthesize uh, an updated understanding of the problem statement probably really seems to be important here. Um, and then, you know, I think there's excellent examples of policy relevant science that can be done um, and that you can engage in as a community um, together, even if the regulators are not at the table. Um, and so what uh, Tessa has on, on the screen is an example of how um, the Puget Sound Institute would like to proceed with that. Yeah, thanks, Marta. So I, I just asked Chris to throw this slide up um, just to keep us uh, hopefully focused on on the discussion questions here, um, inviting input on all of them in our last 10 minutes. Um, and all I see Bart Christensen has his Bart Christian has his uh, hand up. So go ahead, Bart. Tessa. Um, this is actually a question uh, related to what's on the screen right now. So the first point says uh, which species and habitat should be prioritized for consideration. And I'm kind of confused on how do you use, for example, dissolved oxygen to look at impacts in shallow systems where it can have these big diurnal swings and dissolved oxygen. Like, is, is that the best tool to look at impacts in, in those parts of Puget Sound? And I think another comment in the chat was that, you know, in the modeling efforts, the nearshore is not really uh, represented because of, um, you know, difficulties with representing the bathymetry, for example, in, the, in those models. So how, how do these pieces fit together? Uh, because the nearshore is, is where there's a lot of the action in terms of the ecosystem, or where you have a lot of sensitive components of the ecosystem. So could you elaborate a bit on that? Um, minimally, Bart, <laughs> I mean, I think, I think you're asking the right question in terms of, but I, and I think what we're talking about here in terms of, um, like near term projects and sort of the steps here, you know, one step is using some, um, one step is to identify which species we want to, uh, consider and then evaluating, um, oxygen tolerance at some or sensitivity using some metrics. So could be uh, very simply based on a literature review on lethal effects of different oxygen levels. But as Marta suggesting, getting into sublethal effects is more potentially more valuable and more complex and you find more data gaps. And then matching those sensitivity levels to what's observed uh, in the ecosystem is what you're talking about, um, in addition to identifying swings and how species experience ranges um, over their life and over their over a day um, is important. And I don't know how to do that, but I think that you're asking the right question. And I think you're bringing up an important point, which is that our, our models, so if we then take the next step to look at sort of model output to describe um, what the oxygen uh, exposure is that species are experiencing in combination with potentially distribution maps of the species of concern, um, we are, we find some data gaps in the near shore for sure, uh, both with respect to the um, models and their um, spatial specificity, but also I think in terms of the monitoring data. So I think, I think you've essentially identified a data gap um, as opposed to sort of a problem with the approach maybe, um, and maybe the, it may be an opportunity then to sort of say, here's where we actually need to invest more resources in monitoring um, and experiments to understand um, the 
uh, experience in the near shore because of its uh, variability and importance is kind of how, how I would answer. But um, I don't know, Marta, you want to add on to that? Well, I, I, I'm still hearing that there's a lot of issues about fundamentally what's the problem and what's causing it. Um, which, you know, I guess, Tessa, if you were going to sort of take notes on the outcome of this session, what I think is probably important, whether you guys, whether, you know, PSI or someone else supports it uh, is sort of beyond, uh, beyond the question. But ultimately, one of the things that I think is really important is that you know, when you try to get people together working on a problem, that they actually really need to agree what the problem is and what's causing it. And models can be an excellent way to actually try to synthesize that. And so you can look at, well, to what to what to what degree are some of the things that we're seeing in Puget Sound actually being caused by offshore conditions, um, or to try to use observations to correlate how um, fluctuations of abundances. <laughs> of some species are actually tied to offshore climate cycles, for example. Um, and so I think ultimately, you know, the public will and their understanding and view of um, the, the need or urgency to act is really tied to scientific consensus uh, of the problem. And that is something that um, in addition to this work could actually be an important sort of um, thrust of research and synthesis as in order to try to get people on the same page. Yeah, I, pre I appreciate that point. Um, so I see uh, that Hem's hand is raised. Hem, you wanna go next? Thank you, Tessa. Um, thank you, Marta, so much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. I came from working on wetlands in South of California. So I, um, it's really nice to see work there. Uh, my comments are regarding the slide that you have up, Tessa, and um, those specific research actions and discussion questions. Uh, so I guess what I see missing there um, is the, the fact that DO is not acting uh, in, by itself, and that the way the questions and research actions are framed is that it's not considering uh, interactive or cumulative impacts of other stressors. Mm -hmm. And I think that should really be there. Yeah, that's a good point, Hem. And I invite you to elaborate on uh, additional stressors we should cons consider. We've talked about this a lot and we thought we might get into that depending on the direction of the conversation here in this in this room, but go ahead and elaborate on that. Well, um, I was thinking, and. Separately, I've been reading this week a lot about uh, risk assessment. So I'm wondering if instead of uh, just focusing on the salt oxygen, it might be worth uh, starting from the from the perspective of um, there's just so many things that are going on in Puget Sound. Uh, thinking about toxics and contaminants and um, changes in pH and just try to think about risk in terms of um, all those different factors for key species rather than just focus on one stressor. And uh, I see you get a thumbs up there and um, we just got a couple minutes left um, before we have to move, but I guess I would like to hear um, Marta's perspective on how uh, taking a sort of cumulative impacts or multiple stressor approach changes the discussion with respect to decision making, rather than focusing more simply. Um, we're struggling with this too, um, in part because it becomes much more complicated to, to look at multiple stressors. I like the idea of a risk assessment um, approach in, in characterizing the problem. Um, and then the way forward to use it in terms of how we address um, the stressors can really be complementary, especially if the, the, um, the environmental drivers are common among those. For example, 
anthropogenic you know nutrient loads can also be carrying cut toxics right um you know in the end though i i think one of the challenges is still to try to have this conversation in in an expedited fashion because the ecosystem our ecosystems are suffering and so i favor trying to stay within a sort of a topical area of eutrophication because I think that that simplifies it. But I and I do therefore think it's really important to look at multiple lines of evidence, not just oxygen um, or oxygen in combination with temperature, which I think is really important, but also to look at harmful algal blooms, to look at pH effects on, on the ecosystem, to look at sediment organic matter accumulation so that we have a more holistic view of what eutrophication can be doing in this system. And we begin to understand all of the very um, complicated and nonlinear ecosystem feedbacks among those different ecosystem components. So, um, you know, so, Ultimately, I I like the idea and I appreciate Tessa, just sometimes it's enough just to do what you have on, on the screen. Um, but at the same time, especially if you have a lot of scientists in the region engaged and looking at the, these other components, oftentimes what I've seen happens is a model will, will be a complete wash to predict one thing, but is able to predict something else. And that ultimately um, it, it can, relying on multiple lines of evidence is a real advantage um, uh, in an expediting conversation. Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I feel that. I think that resonates with me. For sure. <laughs> Thanks for bringing it up everybody. And so we're gonna just wrap us up. We're gonna head back to the main um, room now. Thanks again to Marta for being willing to be in our group and field more questions thanks to all of y'all for your ideas um and for being in our being in our breakout room today it was a real joy to be with you i'll see you back in the main room now. <laughs>